Hello and welcome to Transparency with Zeb King. The purpose of this show is to interview various leaders in the region and uh, give them an opportunity to explain their uh, unique uh, lives and um, perhaps uh, their, their political positions. Today we have the honor of uh, interviewing Adam Olson, who is deputy leader of the BC Green Party and also a former uh, Central Saanich Municipal Councillor. Uh, and, and I think I served about a year and a half with Adam Olson on council uh, until Adam had de decided to resign in 2013 uh, in order to run in that uh, provincial election. So, in a sense, this is a bit of a, a reunion uh, with Adam Olson, and uh, I'd just like to welcome you to the show, Adam. Thanks, Adam. I think it's a, uh, a, a bit deeper of a reunion than that, because I'm sitting in this seat uh, as a politician. I think, in, to some respect, you're at fault for this, mm. um, and I'm going to I'll blame you, anyway, uh, for knocking incessantly on my door and encouraging me to get involved in the community. And so, I appreciate that. I appreciate the effort that you put in to get me involved in, in my community at a governance level. And so, um, <clears throat> who knew that seven or eight years later that we'd be sitting wow. here like this, right? That it's been that much time. More gray hair than uh, we'd probably want to account. Right, right, indeed. Looking, looking back at, uh, and I think we'll be doing a little bit of that, looking back, sure. uh, but hopefully also looking forward. Mm -hmm. um, looking back to your decision in 2013 to uh, run uh, meet, you know, provincially, and the decision to resign from council, do you think that was the right decision given that some people decide to stay on a council and then if they don't get elected, they, um, they, they, they accomplish something in governance, for example? Uh, so do you, do you think it was the right decision? Uh, to, your, to your question, I think that uh, stepping away, running in the provincial election, and then uh, following that, serving as the interim leader, now as a deputy leader of the BC Greens, that I have been able to stay involved in politics, stay relevant, stay uh, in, involved in the issues. And so um, certainly a seat at the, at the Central Saanich Council table is one way to be involved, but I, but I think that I've, I've been able to stay involved at the provincial level with the BC Greens. Mm -hmm. and, and you have, are currently deputy leader, you but Correct. for a long time um, you were interim? 30 months, yeah. 30 months, yeah. From uh, August of 2013, shortly after the last provincial election, um, our leader at that time, Jane Stark, resigned right. and uh, retired from politics, actually. And um, they were looking for an interim leader, and it was a good opportunity, like I said, to stay relevant and stay involved in the, in the debate in British Columbia. Sure, sure. So staying on the municipal theme, sure. um, uh, You've probably been reading in the um, Peninsula News Review some of the issues on the peninsula, such as, for example, the gateway development uh, <coughs> proposal, the uh, as well the sand down proposal, mm -hmm. and uh, there's some concern by some people in the community about the potential for big box stores coming to the peninsula. And I know from your experience in the past on municipal council, I think you've expressed some hesitation, maybe even opposition to big box stores. Uh, and or mid-sized box stores even, there's some discussion about that. Um, and, and I wondered if you had a position or, or an opinion on the potential for uh, these types of stores moving to the peninsula. Um, clearly my role as a provincial, as a, as a hopefully future MLA, um, is not to get into, I think, the, the um, the decision-making process too much, to insert myself into it too much. Those are decisions that you as a Central Saanich Councillor and councils in North Saanich and Sydney have to make for their community and there's a public hearing and, a, and an important process for that. So um, I will remove myself from the discussion at that stage but I will, I, I will answer your question and, and be transparent about it in that um, I do have big concerns about and I think that there's lots of evidence to show that large box stores, mid box stores, whatever you want to call it, the, that big footprint, that big, um, big footprint store, has um, caused significant um, economic damage to towns in Canada and in North America. 
Uh, and when communities and councils are making decisions about uh, that kind of development, they have to do it very carefully. We've got two municipalities right now that are both kind of chasing the same amount of commercial development, both saying that there is a need for it. And um, I, I, I really worry actually that the, the relationships between the municipalities, the relationships between First Nations, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. are growing toxic. And, and so for me, I really hope uh, as an MLA to be a facilitator in bringing those discussions together. Interesting because uh, what that raises for me is that the, before we were hearing of Gateway and, and well around the time of Sandown perhaps uh, early stages, there was the Jeskin uh, sure. discussion and, and in terms of some of the reaction in the community to what was proposed there and stuff. And, uh, so maybe there, that's what you're talking about. There's 60 there's 60 local government, including First Nations, uh, elected officials in Saanich North of mm -hmm. the Islands. Mm -hmm. um, that's a, there's a lot of opinions sitting around uh, important decision-making tables. And uh, if we do not have a facilitator as MLA, I think, I think to some extent we see what, what the result of that is. And we need to have somebody who can, uh, who can facilitate and be, and be a, a unifying bridge across. Not, not getting into the, the granular discussions about how a decision is made or what decision is made, but ensuring that there's open communication and positive communication. Thank you. And, and uh, uh, staying on that sort of uh, topic of uh, municipalities, decisions that are faced by municipalities, etc. Recently, Central Sandwich Council received a letter and presentation from the school board asking the municipality to waive fees uh, associated with repairing the roof of the uh, Bayside School, which you're probably quite familiar right, with yeah, in yeah. terms of uh, what's going on there and the, the leaking, etc. Um, the province has uh, said they will pay for a certain amount for the school. Then the school board has come forward uh, and asked if the municipality could waive some of the fees. I said at the council meeting that um, there aren't, isn't much of a way for municipalities to raise money, um, but uh, fees uh, pay for things like sidewalks and this sort of thing and so it seemed like really uh, where the money should come from is the province they own the school and they have to in my opinion pay the fees uh, and so apparently well no, not apparently we're going to take this up with uh, the minister at the Union of BC municipalities meeting at the end of the month supporting the school uh, supporting the school board but trying to put the onus on the province to pay uh, the cost. Well, look, the people of Central Saanich already pay a tremendous amount of, their, of, of, that, of that portion of their taxes go to education, is my understanding. So mm -hmm. um, the, I think that the people of Central Saanich are already paying uh, a, tr a significant part of the bill. So for me, um, the education definitely falls within the jurisdiction of the province. Uh, and it's incumbent upon the provincial government to ensure that our students have got a good quality education in a safe building mm -hmm. um, so that it's not raining inside. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm not, I, this is the first I've heard of that specific issue. Uh, certainly education uh, for me, and not just because I'm a parent of, of students, but education is the number one investment that uh, provincial government can make in its, in, in its society. Uh, in the province, and I think that we need to do everything we can to ensure our students are in uh, safe, warm places to learn. Right, and and that provides me a, a nice segue. You, you mentioned uh, your your children. You have a son and a daughter. Son and a daughter. Yeah. Yeah, and and, and I recall in the past, um, I think it was a number of years ago during the teacher strike that you were concerned, uh, uh, upset perhaps about the teacher strike. Um, and what I'd like to get a sense of for viewers is uh, your position on labor and unions. Um, and um, I think we've had the conversation in the past that uh, you felt that, uh, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that, that unions are past their time or that, they, um, that we don't have kids in the coal mines anymore. So what, what's, what, what exactly are they doing? You know? No, I think labor organization is, in, is important. Uh, absolutely. I think that the the uh, BC Teachers Union has, and, and as we saw in, in that, uh, done their best to represent uh, the, the interests of the teachers. And um, I, I think though that there is a very, very um, poor relationship between the provincial government and uh, the, the BC Teachers Federation, and we saw it play out, I guess it's probably a, a couple of years ago. But no, 
I think that it's important that we acknowledge the fact that organized labor has um, brought about change in the workforce, and uh, and I think that there is I think that there is a role for organized labor for sure, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, so now what I'd like to do is transition with the questions a little bit to a little bit of an understanding and explanation of the Green Party. Uh, sure. And uh, I can't think of anyone who could explain it better uh, uh, to me. But, 30 uh, months of practice. Right, there you go. <laughs> um, and I think viewers would like to understand the Green Party a little bit. Um, sure. But just to begin with, and this sort of harkens back to previous conversations we've had in the past too, and, and maybe you can explain your position now. Um, in the past, I think you've told me that you don't believe in political parties. So, where would that stand today? In the research, to uh, uh, to be uh, running as an independent MLA, there's you, you can't set up a constituency association. You can't give people tax receipts for fundraising. There are all sorts of uh, disadvantages that the party process, the party system, has established in order to make running for parties more attractive. Uh, more attractive, um, and so in in doing that research and and in, in, in collecting that information, um, I made the decision that if I was going to invest the time and invest my own money into running as a as a um, as an MLA, that running for a party um, has some great advantages to it. And so in choosing the BC Green Party, I chose a party that aligned with my values. Um, values that uh, are important for me, um, but as well allowed some flexibility and did not uh, operate in this strict command and control that we see from the other political parties in, this, in, the, in the province. So you, uh, and it's not a surprise that you, you've picked the Green Party that you would feel comfortable there. Um, what, what I'm thinking of this uh, could help transition to in terms of an explanation with the Green Party uh, in terms of the values that you mentioned. Um, is perhaps an explanation of how the Green Party reconciles those values that, that they have and not having whipped votes. Um, and I think that's the same for the federal and provincial. Uh, yeah, correct, yeah. And, um, uh, not ex with the exception of um, matters of confidence, but anyway. Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. So the vast majority of the decisions. I think the confusion that might exist for some um, people is the, the, the Green Party has a convention, the Green Party has a platform, uh, yeah. uh, the federal leader Elizabeth May has recently expressed some um, concern with the position of her members, uh, and, and yet it's not entirely clear how that relates within the Green Party if each individual um, elected representative can go their own way to heck with uh, uh, the way the convention went, or what the party says, because they can vote their own conscience. So the question comes up as to whether why, why uh, the leader, uh, the federal leader in that case, but any uh, say MLA um, would be concerned about the vote at a convention when they can vote the way they wish to, uh, unlike other parties where you would have a vote at convention and that would have to be followed to some degree. Um, well, I think. Anyway, right. On. So, so, uh, or the platform, or uh, you know, so the, the relationship between what is this party? It, this party is a party that does follow uh, what the membership wants at a convention, or is a party of individuals. Um, so, I, I, I thought we're, maybe you could help reconcile. Yeah. So, I'm I'm happy to address the federal stuff separately, sure. and it's probably a fair question. Yeah. There was a, there's a huge amount to unpack there, but. What, what I'll say is that my primary responsibility as an MLA, as, the, as a member of the Legislative Assembly, is to represent the people who elected me within the precinct with which I ran. That's my primary responsibility. As our government has evolved, um, what has happened is we've had MLAs who represent their party first. And, their, and, and oftentimes how it, what it looks like is it looks like um, to the constituents that they're representing their party to, to the riding rather than their riding in Victoria, uh, in, in the legislature. And so for me, it's really important that we are, if through with our party um, framework, that we provide uh, values with which we will operate, 
a framework with which we will come to uh, s uh, collect and, and be informed, collect information and be informed about whatever problem it is that we're trying to solve, but that MLAs are, and government is given the flexibility to be able to find the best solution to, the, to what it is that the problem is that we're facing. What is happening in Victoria, and I've watched it now for the last three years, is I've watched that stressfulness, that the pain that governors, people who are governing should feel, is completely taken away. The only thing that I can see, the only stress around it would be the personal stress of somebody standing up when perhaps they don't feel like it represents their constituents or represents their values. And we have, I, I have watched the legislature mm. where one side all stands up, sits down, the next side all stands up and sits down. And I know for a fact that the, the, that does not represent the feelings of the room. But yet, there they are. What, what you see in the legislature when people are voting on, on policy is not representative of what those individuals feel. Or it's not, and it's also not representative necessarily of the best interests or in the, uh, of the, the opinions of the constituents in those writings. And I think that it, it, the, the system that we have, the, so you're asking me how I reconcile it. I, I would flip that around and say how to, to those that are in the legislature, how do you reconcile standing up when perhaps you don't agree with your party on something? What I'll say is that we need a, a, a legislature that it brings the negotiation back, brings the, the real discussions and the real dialogue back. What we have right now is, is there, there is no negotiation. There is no flexibility and, and in my opinion it doesn't reflect the world that we live in which is constantly uh, people are constantly negotiating with one another it's important I think for us to move away from uh, these these really rigid command and control top-down party structures that we have and start to loosen it up and start to allow uh, really smart people and people who have got a lot to offer allow them to offer those things. So before, before we leave this one, I, I think um, it, it may be the case that there's confusion uh, for some people as to whether they're voting for uh, the, the, the person, the platform, to what degree does that person agree with the platform or are they free to not to agree with it. And, and related to the federal um, scene, the more recent uh, right. situation with uh, and I was there, so uh, Elizabeth May at the convention. Yeah. Okay. Um, if I understand correctly, there was there was a vote on a resolution uh, that the federal leader Elizabeth May disagreed with. The outcome uh, took a week off or something to think about her position in the party. -ish. The week off was happening. Okay, she, fair enough. It's a holiday. But sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and ultimately uh, decided to stay uh, as leader. Mm -hmm. um, the the question that comes up is if she could simply disagree. Um, with the uh, decision and I make that a, a, her conscience, uh, she couldn't agree with it, whatever. Um, to what degree is she bound by the decision of the party uh, and uh, the membership at a convention? And uh, it, 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 you know, there's the, the, the issue for Green Party uh, politicians. Do they stick with what their party votes for at convention or are they able to go any way they wish? Well, well, look, I mean, what, what I'd say to that, to, to the resolution that was passed, is, is a prime example of actually what I've just been talking about. Right. This is a, this is a, a resolution that is very prescriptive to, spe to one specific situation and applying certain tools, foreign policy tools, uh, to, a, to one specific situation um, really doesn't provide any opportunity for, uh, for other situations to be in, um, solved. So by saying boycott, divestment, and sanctions of Israel um, in, in a party policy of, of, a, of a national party is, is um, wrong-headed policy making in my opinion. But saying uh, that the, the Green Party of Canada or this party X uh, th uh, believes the membership believes that we should be able to apply boycott, divestment, and sanctions in instances, you know, as foreign policy tools in instances where human rights are being violated. Now, that's a policy that I can support mm -hmm. because it allows, and this is what I was talking about with the flexibility of, of 
those in government, is that things happen, issues arise that may not uh, uh, be um, prominent now that when they're passing this resolution. So why do we want, why, why would the membership of the, the Green Party of Canada, or why would the people actually more specifically drafting that resolution handcuff Elizabeth on the, on the floor of the, the House of Commons? A huge issue that I had with it was that that uh, convention opened acknowledging that we were on the unceded territory of Algonquin people. And the, the Green Party of Canada, the, the people who were drafting that resolution, were suggesting that we apply boycott, divestment, and sh sanction tools against Israel, for the, the Israel-Palestine issue, when we have got significant, as an indigenous person, it was very uncomfortable for me to be there, because we have got a, an awful history of land settlement in this country, and um, it, it, it was a bit rich putting it nicely, for me to see this unfold where we have got to reconcile our past and we have to do that. And I'm not saying that, we, that, it's, that, it's, uh, uh, that it's the only thing that we do, but we at least have to do it. Mm. And, and so for me, um, it, the irony was not lost on me that on one hand we were saying that we would apply boycott, divestment and sanctions for uh, this other instance where land settlement was happening um, in a, inappropriately uh, and in a, and in a um, often violent and, and ugly kind of way when our often violent and ugly history was, was acknowledged at the beginning. And the suggestion that we would apply these, um, these tools, these foreign policy tools, uh, I mean, the, the, somebody could have stood up and suggested, uh, and in fact I think I did, <laughs> that we could be applying these to ourselves. And so we need to be very, very careful. And, and that's why I think that the, the Green Party of Canada needs to draw themselves away from a, um, making policy that applies a specific solution to a specific problem and start giving their elected officials the tools that they need um, to be able to respond to whatever happens. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate your insight into the convention that you attended. Mm -hmm. um, let's uh, leave that topic as we've sure. kind of talked about that for a bit. Uh, as a Green Party politician, can you give us some examples of actions that you've taken to help our environment, say in relation to your lifestyle or some things that you've led the way on? That might on be a familiar the, question. Um, the, the answer for me is that I've become deeply involved in uh, these massive projects that are being proposed within the Salish Sea um, and uh, the environmental impacts that are going to be here. And I've actually invested dozens, hundreds, maybe thousands of hours into those processes as a volunteer mm -hmm. um, to ensure that the environment that we have surrounding us, the place that we that we grew up, the place that we live, the place that we're raising our children, um, you know, is being properly accounted for in the decision making that uh, the upstream and downstream impacts of um, fossil fuel extraction, um, liquefaction, uh, d d dilution, shipping and export uh, only to be burned somewhere else, that all of those are being accounted for. So my commitment for the environment has been one uh, has been you know pretty substantial over the past uh, two two and a half years just in, in taking a look at those two projects uh, a lot a lot of heart and soul has been put into uh, making sure that I could be uh, at the tables and accountable and accounted for when uh, the National Energy Board came through and wanted to hear uh, the opinions uh, and and wanted to hear people's input on those projects, I was there at the table uh, and investing my own time and my own money, getting volunteer lawyers to try to help me out. And I think you have a, a track record, is, it, it's clear uh, that you have a track record on those macro kind of uh, projects, those macro initiatives, that activism. Right. Um, it, the question is trying to get to something of a micro level that the average voter as well uh, struggles with when they make a decision, when they're either going to the store, when they're uh, you know, buying a new vehicle when they're, you know, doing something in their yard, whatever. 
right. and and I think uh, you know it's a fair question that uh, how have you approached those things, um, and have you found any ways to uh, make the green choice? Uh, you might say. Well, I mean, I, friendly choice. we recently just moved into a new house that is uh, far more energy efficient than the one that we uh, that we lived in, and it's designed to take advantage of solar gain. And and um, you know, we rarely use electricity to heat our house now. The sun is doing it, whether it be uh, the the well, and actually, it's it's cooling our house too, the way it's designed. So, look, I mean, I think that um, the, yes. Uh, it is the biggest challenge I think that we have as citizens to, to be modifying our behavior from the perspective of somebody who's been uh, um, sort of active on uh, environmental issues. Um, certainly I've spent uh, uh, many, many hundreds of hours um, just engrossed in the, uh, the, the, the really substantial threat that we have surrounding us right now in Sanich in, in this place with the massive industrialization of the Salish Sea. Uh, it's happening, the projects are, are being put forward, and uh, the governments are making decisions, and they're not making decisions with the right uh, information as far as I'm concerned. So, mm -hmm. uh, If you were elected uh, in the next election, what's your number one priority? Uh, what would you like to get accomplished? Well, you know what, I think that the, the number one thing that I would like to do is uh, is start to facilitate, going back to the, the uh, piece that I touched sure. on earlier, and that is to be a facilitator. One of the, one of the best parts of this job, being a candidate, and, um, is the number of people that I get to meet. It is the, the most thrilling part of being in politics or being in governance is the, uh, the, the opportunities to meet with citizens, the opportunities to meet with uh, you know, edu educators, business people, uh, community leaders such as yourself, and, and uh, First Nations leaders and trustees, um, and really get to hear the challenges that communities are facing. One of, the, one of the best parts of that is that oftentimes I'm finding that the solution to somebody's problem is often either in a meeting that I had a week and a half before, or will show up you know, three or four days later in another meeting that I'm having. And so, Really, I think that the most exciting part of this job for me is connecting so solutions to problems. Oftentimes, uh, people will question the ability of um, somebody from a non-governing party to get uh, stuff done. You know, be elected, you're not going to be able to get anything done because the government's going to uh, punish the, the riding for not electing a member uh, of government. And I think that it's important to acknowledge that every single member all 87 elected representatives are members of our government and that, yes, getting things done or getting things accomplished or um, uh, getting infrastructure uh, investments, say for an example, might be more difficult for uh, a member of the legislature who's not in the, in the governing party. But that said, there are ways uh, to, to have success. Uh, it's important to build those relationships and make sure that the relationships within the legislature are strong uh, and that uh, the MLA is investing in those relationships, whether it be a member of the government, governing party or a member of the opposition. Uh, each and every member of that, of that legislature uh, has, has a considerable amount of, of power to get things done. Thank you, Adam. Uh, w one more line of questioning. This might jump back a little bit, um, but uh, I, uh, perhaps it's useful. Um, what is the Green Party's position, maybe your position, on corporate money and, and in, in provincial politics? And um, I know I think it's um, <clears throat> the province of Alberta that's changed yeah. to that. I don't know. Ontario. Ontario as well. Yeah, and the federal government's got a very strict, um, you know, very strict rules on who can donate. Look. Corporate money, um, labor money, is polluting our government. There's just no question about it. Um, decisions are being made based on who's funding political parties. Uh, and we need to get back to, and, and that's politics. You know, that's, that is politics. We need to get back to governing. Um, the correct answer to 
for the correct solution to a problem has nothing to do with who donated to your political party. Yeah, every party is uh, arguably currently tainted with some corporate money, wouldn't you say, some, even yes. the Green Party? Um, very, 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 very little, right. but yes. Integrity you know. BC reported that uh, uh, Quebec Real Estate Limited contributed $9,765 to the Green Party. So yeah. um, there are uh, examples about... Uh, probably different for the Green Party sure. than the... Uh, I'm sure Integrity BC will talk about the fish farms that are donating to the NDP and the mining companies, executives that are donating to the Liberal Party. So, yeah, I'm, I'm certain that, that Integrity BC is all over highlighting... All the parties. Yeah, absolutely. And, and what you would... It, and is it correct that the Green Party would like to uh, yeah, change that? absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. It's part of strengthening our democracy, for sure. Well, Adam... Thank you very much for coming on Transparency and Heidja for that. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Heidja, thanks for having me. And um, hey, good luck. Uh, good luck with uh, the other candidates and the other episodes of the show. I'm honored to be the uh, one of the first, if not the first. And um, thank you.